Production funding for Ruckus has been provided by Fred and Lou Hartwig and viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Ruckus, our weekly food for thought fight over the news of the day and the trends of the times. I'm Mike Shannon. The Ruckheads join me shortly in our topics tonight. Brownback says no to Gitmo, no dollars for some scholars, and no way of knowing Kansas City's future, plus roast and toast. But we start with our newsmaker segment and talk with Larry Meeker, the former mayor of Lake Quivira, a former vice president at the Federal Reserve Bank in Kansas City, and now the former chairman of the Kansas Democratic Party. Meeker resigned a couple of weeks ago after his fellow Democrats became agitated about his suggestion that the party move rightward and rebrand itself in the hope of winning more elections. He also suggested the party widen its tent and welcome people with diverse views on such topics as abortion and same-sex marriage. We'll get some perspective on what happened as we welcome former Kansas Democratic Party Chairman Larry Meeker. Thanks for joining us on Ruckus. Thank you, Mike, and thank you for inviting me to your program this morning. Now, why would you resign from a job you obviously worked hard to get and presumably wanted? Well, at the end of the day, it was not about me. It was about the conversation within the Democratic Party. Uh, there were very different views as the big uh, tent party, as you well know, and I felt it probably better that I not be there and let that conversation go on because it's a conversation I'd started. Well, what kinds of suggestions did you make that seemed to alarm people so? Well, the news got a bit out of, out of hand a few times uh, in the sense of not even <clears throat> reporting things accurately. I made the comment, for example, that the Democratic Party uh, does have within it people who are uh, anti-abortion and people who are anti-gay. But uh, nonetheless, those are not the issues that I think we need to be focusing on today. We need to be focusing on what's happening in Topeka and what's happening with the brownback, a Republican-led uh, experiment here in Kansas. Well, and, that experiment, and that experiment is a real problem. It's not just a failed experiment, but it's, a, it's an experiment that is doing direct harm to Kansas today. And you can see that in the numbers. Well, why weren't Democrats elected then? when the election was held. Why wasn't there a Democratic governor elected? Well, I felt at the time the party needs to have a name <clears throat> and, and, and uh, something behind it. It needs to, you need to know what you get when you vote for a Democrat. It's not enough to simply be against what's there, but you have to understand what you're for. The Republicans have had, I think, a good pickup line for many years, smaller government, lower taxes, but now it's getting them in trouble because they've, they've never answered the question, how small, how low, and who pays? And now that we find through this last tax increase in the Kansas legislature, the largest in history, running sales taxes up for the middle and lower income taxes primarily, now we're finding out who pays. And as we see our schools with less funding in the classroom, our road budget decimated uh, to ex fund this experiment, we're finding out how small and what services apparently aren't that important in this administration. Well, people in Kansas are paying lower income taxes. They're paying lower income taxes, but you have to look at where the shift in taxation burden is going. And it's going from a few uh, onto the middle and lower income class people. Those sales tax increases are huge uh, in, in the state of Kansas. Uh, you are quoted as saying you wanted to rebrand the party. What is the brand now of the Democratic Party in Kansas? Well, I think generally we're just simply known as Democrats. Uh, the Republicans do a good job of branding us when it comes election time. Or Nancy Pelosi, Harry Reid, and anything else they can find that they think is problematic in Washington. When indeed the state issues are quite different than the national issues. At, the, at a minimum, we need to brand ourselves as Kansas Democrats, different from California Democrats, Massachusetts Democrats, or any others. Are Kansas Democrats different than Massachusetts Democrats and other Democrats across the country? Well, I think very much they are. I, I spoke, How so? I spoke to many uh, Democratic uh, Party gatherings across this state, from Liberal to Kansas City, Kansas, Abilene, down to Wellington. And uh, in each of those, I made a comment. I said, I think, I'm trying out a hypothesis, that the median Kansas Democrat 
would qualify as a moderate Republican in Massachusetts or California. People were sort of taken back that I would compare a Democrat to a Republican in that way, but then they shook their heads and they said, yeah, that's true. And if you look back across the history of Kansas, the dockings, uh, Kathleen Sebelius, these folks have been moderates, they've been conservative, they've run a responsible government. When I think about conservatism in politics, I think about running a government responsibly. This particular government we have today in, in, in Topeka has diminished our credit rating, uh, borrowed, uh, doubled the debt since Mr. Brownback has been in office, uh, putting debt service ahead of human services, roads, schools, everything else because of the way they financed it. Uh, our credit rating's been downgraded. Uh, it's not a good picture. We borrowed a billion dollars to invest in cable. Are you still welcome at party functions? Very much so. Are you going to stay involved in Kansas party politics? Oh, yes, I will. No doubt about that. No <laughs> doubt about if that. If you could rebrand the party, what would the brand be? Would you call it the Red State Democrats? I think, I think as a matter of fact, we are Red State Democrats. We are Democrats in a red state. I would just simply brand us Kansas Democrats, making the Kansas the emphasis in that particular Larry, process. thank you very much for coming by today. Thank you. That was former Kansas Democratic Party Chairman Larry Meeker. Now let's meet the panel and see if we can start a ruckus. Jason Grill is a former Missouri State Representative and now runs J. Grill Media. Marianne Murray Simons is a consultant and freelance writer. Mary O'Halloran is a media and communications consultant. And Woody Kozad is president of the Kozad Company, a government relations firm. Since day one in the White House, President Obama has pledged to close the detention camp at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. So far, he has failed, despite the advice of late-night comic Seth Meyers, who said all he needs to do is put up a Radio Shack sign outside the facility. Now the government is looking at moving Gitmo prisoners to the Army Disciplinary Barracks at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Governor Brownback, Senator Roberts, and a lot of Leavenworth residents are opposed, fearing the move might make Leavenworth a target of terrorists. Some say, however, that concern is exaggerated, perhaps unnecessary, pointing out that Leavenworth is already home to a federal prison and a couple of state prisons in addition to the military facility. So is moving the Gitmo detainees to Leavenworth in the metro area a threat or no big deal, Woody? Well, of course it's a threat for exactly the reason they say. And the statement they've already got a prison there is just a known sequitur. The, the reality is that terrorism consists of something murderous and dramatic that scares people. Uh, to draw attention to it, you generally look for uh, a peg. Have I lost the mic? I'm not sure. I'm getting signs. Of... So uh, if I have, I don't know where it went. Well, I'm hearing you. There he is. Hanging okay. in my tie. <laughs> okay. So a, a terrorist attack, gen, they, they look for generally. I think it's terrorism. Always, look, for a peg, look for a peg of some sort. And so this just makes Leavenworth a place in the middle of nowhere that would have been way down anybody's list uh, uh, in the Middle East of places to hit. All of a sudden, it makes it a, a reason, quote unquote, if they can call it that, to, to make that a target. So of course it makes it a target. The second question I have is, well, why are we bothering? Uh, there was this conceit when uh, Obama ran the first time that uh, Gitmo damaged our moral standing in the world. Nobody's talking about it anymore except the combined readership of the Nation magazine, which amounts to about 50 or 60,000 people. It, you haven't heard about Gitmo. And the president's obsessed with it because he made this commitment. But in fact, it is not damaging our reputation in the world. If it ever was, it isn't now. Leave it alone. Well, well some people say it fuels terrorism around the world, that it's a major cause it of uh, terrorism. And uh, Mary, uh, do you see any rational reason to close Gitmo, considering the fact that the Congress has said no money can be spent on moving prisoners from Gitmo to the United States? Well, I think uh, Woody is right. The president is obsessed with his commitment. And good for him. He ran for office, and one of his promises to the people of the United States is that he would remove the, uh, the uh, prison at Guantanamo, Guantanamo uh, from the American, uh, from the, well, from the residue of the George Bush administration. And the idea, Brown Back had these meetings, and, and you know, there was no one there, the Kansas Star adequately pointed out that there was no one there to present the other side. 
There were no military uh, officials, nobody from the barracks. Well, you're you know, saying it's all political on Brownback's well, part. Well, gee, Mike, when was the last time the governor of Kansas graciously, this is a man who would not shake the president of the United States' hand when he came to Osawatomie to give his famous speech. So the idea that uh, the people of Leavenworth, who have been imprisoning people safely and well and competently for a hundred years, could not take care of about 50 or well, 60 Well, that was the point in talking uh, about prisons. There are prisons there, we and we know. don't have these kind they of problems prisons. take place. Yes, the military prisoners. Mary Ann, do you think this is all them. political on the part of the governor? I do. I think it's very political. It obviously is an issue that cannot happen by law until something changes. This is a study that's happening right now, and I think everyone is doing a lot of political posturing, including our state officials and local officials, to try and raise the flag of uh, terrorism coming into the Midwest. Well, it's a little overkill. Jason, uh, some people were concerned it would hurt terrorism. If the uh, tourism, uh, tourism, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, <laughs> would, would not hurt terrorism. Hurt tourism <laughs> if uh, Gitmo prisoners were moved to Leavenworth. I'm not sure Leavenworth is a hot tourist trap, but, I don't know but if the metro the Kansas City area, you think it have any effect? Uh, maybe a little bit, but I, I agree with Marianne. I mean, I think this is a political deal. I mean, they should have had both sides, but uh, people are listening now, and it is getting exposure. And I think that the more of that that happens, the more people will be afraid maybe to go to Leavenworth. I mean, I don't know how oh. many people go there very often, but I could see people really not going there. Well, Mary. One of the people said that uh, it would discourage army officers from wanting to attend the command and general staff college at Fort Leavenworth. I think it would make them want I, to I, I, Well, I, I would say just from my <laughs> limited experience in the army, and as you know, my wife used to work at the command and general staff college. Right. Uh, first of all, I'm not sure they have any choice. And number two, if you want to be considered for the role of a general officer in the U.S. Army, Fort Leavenworth, the Command and General Staff College, is one of several that you Absolutely. either have to attend or you'll never we compete for foreign officers to go there. And those foreign officers wind up being very important people. And they have choices. They can go there or they can go to the Russians Command and General Staff School or the Chinese Command and General Staff School or the Pakistani Command and General Staff School. So they may decide, I think I'll go to Russia. I'll go to China. I think there's a question there well, that's you, real. Yeah. Well, but, 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 but the finally, concern wasn't about foreign leaders or military no. coming. Well, the question be. was about U.S. Army officers but it, refusing Mike, to attend. I, I, grew won't refuse. in, I grew up in the state of, of Nebraska, and it, we had something called the Strategic Air Command mm -hmm. located right. at, off at yeah. Air Force Base. I've been there. I've been down to the control room. And I'll tell you, talk about targets during the Cold War. I never heard a Nebraskan say, oh, dear, oh, dear, it would be very dangerous to have. The, the comparison doesn't even it doesn't even but they did okay. they said it in relation to <laughs> nuclear weapons right. that it would make you a target for nuclear we got to move on here. we took care they of did it. Say hey, it we're, we're we through with, we're, we're, we're through with this discussion <laughs> longtime <laughs> kansas city star columnist and ruckus alumnus yale abahaka sees the prospect of great progress for the kansas city area by 2025 but with a nod to reality yale also notes his positive prognostications might not come to fruition in the upbeat version yale sees the new KCI opening to rave reviews, streetcars extending to the Country Club Plaza, supporters rolling out plans for a downtown baseball stadium, and Johnson County joining Jackson and Clay and providing sales tax support for the Kansas City Zoo. Which, if any of these potential scenarios strike you as plausible and possible, Mary then Mary Ann. I searched very hard for one <laughs> that was plausible. Po well, of course, all possible. I mean, there's nothing... There's nothing radical about what Yale's written here. Um, it, well, it's fun to say on the one hand, this could happen. On the other hand, maybe it won't. And he's speculating all over the newspaper's uh, editorial page. I don't think we're going to have a baseball stadium downtown in Kansas City. I know there's some that would just like to get the West Bottoms and just put it in down there with all that parking right there by the river. Um, I don't think that's going to happen. The, the, he left out some things that I'm really kind of interested in. One is there's a group of people working kind of uh, silently and quietly to uh, put a lid over 670 coming through the downtown and create the first downtown urban park between the river and uh, Crown Center. I thought the idea was crazy the first time I heard it, and the more I listen to these people, the more I think that 
is a nifty idea. And so there are things that I agree well, with. Mary Ann, I in about I, 25 years. Mary Ann, I inferred That's from right. Yale's <laughs> column that when he said the new KCI, he was thinking of a rebuilt, a brand new KCI. How likely do you think that is now, considering the fact that the new city council has a special airport committee and is looking hard at the data about the possibility of renovating instead of rebuilding? <clears throat> I heard Julie Justice earlier this week talking about that very yeah, subject. Yeah, she chairs that committee. Right, and wants to be very thorough in the analysis of whether or not it's the right thing to do. I think it will happen. I think we will have it by the time 2025 comes around. And it is the right thing for Kansas City, but there's process we have to go through. Other process that I think will lead to change in Kansas City is redevelopment of the riverfront. And I think the ballparks could be a part of that redevelopment that happens. And last but not least is some kind of bi-state organization that helps with taxing authority to help with issues that affect both sides of the state line. It's very contentious, but it's being talked about in both yes. Kansas and Missouri, and I think in 10 years it is possible Mary's that favorite, could happen. Mary's favorite <laughs> former mayor, Mark Funkhauser, talked about the idea of a bi-state amenities tax. Do you remember that? Uh, a little bit, Mike. I think that is probably the least thing that's going to happen. I really think that the airport's going to happen. I think that we are going to have a downtown baseball stadium. I know people are already talking about that now to plan really? that because of the Royal success. We've got more money coming in. I think that we're going to have uh, obviously more people living downtown. I think we're going to have uh, what other things that we talk about? Oh, the street car. street car. Heck, we might have driverless cars and automated cars if our tech community keeps growing. So there's a lot of positives. I think the least of those was probably the zoo thing. I don't think that'll probably be on top of it. And I don't think it's the zoo thing that I'm talking about. I'm talking about yeah. taxing authority for issues right. that affects yeah. the entire metro area way beyond the arts. Oh, I agree with you, Marianne. If we, if we did one thing by, in a bi-state way, it should be the uh, commuter rail or something right. close to that that uh, County Executive Mike Sanders and uh, Clyde James have worked on so, so diligently. Do one thing in a bi-state way. One. You should elect your officials that way. And then they'll think they belong to a single to city. Administer the bi -state to, to, to administer the bi-state tax. <laughs> Is that what you're talking yeah, about? I, yeah. I should not live in Johnson yeah. County and send money to City right. Hall and let them that, spend that, it, that, and I don't get to vote that, on that, the that was what Fun, That's that. what Funkhauser talked about when he proposed it. Uh, Woody, uh, Yale's column, uh, despite all this uh, glowing talk about what the future could hold, added this. Yet this city still is not holding its own against many of its main competitors in the Midwest and elsewhere in creating jobs, which at the end of the day are crucial to building a more vibrant future. You agree with that, don't you? The overall, sure. There, most American cities, though, are really doing badly at that. Uh, the core cities of, of most American metro areas are doing badly at that. Uh, the Look, I look at these things, uh, the, 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 the boom in people living downtown is part of a boom in multifamily housing, both condo and apartment. Uh, it is a boom on the way to becoming a bubble, on the way to bursting, and people I talk to, financial officers, they've made their companies have made money out of it, they're not going back for another round because they think that's gonna pop. That will flatten out the growth in downtown for several years. We need more I, businesses down there, Woody. What? We need more businesses to come <laughs> in down there. But you're not getting there. You're getting more people, and the and the jobs are leaving. It's right, and that's exactly going to be a problem because these people want to well, live closer to their jobs. If the businesses yeah. go down there, they can certainly get tiffs, can't they? Well, one thing that's going to happen. Baseball stadium could go to Kansas. When the streetcar right, goes no, right. down through right. it, the, the rents are going to oh, go. We got to go. That's okay. where the ticket when the, the problem. When the Missouri legislature reconvenes next week for the veto session, one hot topic will be the Missouri taxpayer funded A plus scholarship program. At issue is whether undocumented young people brought illegally to this country, but now living here legally under executive orders issued by President Obama, can receive the scholarships. The GOP-dominated legislature voted no, but Governor Nixon vetoed the legislation. The measure's sponsor, Republican Scott Fitzpatrick, says the issue is simple. If you're not in the country legally, you shouldn't get benefits paid for by taxpayers. Do you agree with that position, Jason? I can't tell you how many times when I was in Jeff City I heard, this is a simple bill, Mike, and that's what the <laughs> representative said. Everything's so simple in Jeff City, but it never gets done. This is obviously a complicated issue, and uh, 
I think that was a, a good, you know, fiery line. But I think that at the end of the day, the governor was right to uh, veto the bill. The, the problem is, is that the legislature will probably override that. I think they only need 109 votes in the House and 23 in the Senate. And they had those numbers or close to those. And 11 Republicans weren't even there to vote that day. So uh, the fact of the matter is, is that this will probably get overridden and uh, it will be the law in Missouri. What about this, Marianne? Uh, you think these scholarships should be given to young people who came here illegally but through no fault of their own? I think the bottom line is we have to educate our young people so that we have an educated electorate coming in to take over what is happening right now. We need new blood, we need new energy, we need new leadership. And the only way you get that is through education. So to turn your back on kids who have worked really hard to position themselves to be successful, I think is a slap Good in the point. face. Uh, Woody, you're our expert about what's going on in Jeff City and what's likely to happen. Is Jason right? Is this uh, bill going to be, this veto going to be overridden? I think so, and I think the, the kind of killer argument is the one uh, presented by the floor leader, Mike Searpoy, at least, somebody who said, no money. Uh, we don't have enough money for everybody who is legally here in the country who qualifies for an A-plus scholarship. Why are we going to give money to these folks? And that's a tough argument. Uh, to to answer. So I think it's, yeah, this one's liable to be overridden. And these are not just given out to anybody. Uh, there are right. some rather exactly. stringent requirements. Well, well, they have to attend the Missouri <laughs> High School for three years and graduated with a 2.5 GPA, 95% attendance record, and 50 hours of tutoring or mentoring. Then they qualify, presumably, exactly. for the scholarship. That's a lot. High school, these high school kids it's have a high to grade be point average. Very, isn't it? very <laughs> uh, upper uh, upper rank uh, uh, kids receiving the scholarships. You know, when I look at an issue like this that you suggest that we're going to talk about, I always try to find out well what's wrong with the thing and where where's the argument. There isn't a single thing that I could find wrong <coughs> with this program, other than this mad Republican obsession with immigration. And one of these guys, I can't remember which one it was, calling these kids, almost calling them criminals. They're not here legally, and so why should we ever invest a dime in them? These are children that did not come to Missouri of their own accord. They were brought here, and they're going to probably be here. And if we're smart, we will invest in the these kids that are able to meet all these standards, invest a few dollars to see that they can go to a community college or get going on a career. What a smart thing to do. Good for Jay well, Nixon. Well, why is the program underfunded, do you suppose? Everyone <laughs> thinks everything's underfunded in education, Mike. I mean, in Jeff City, I, I think it, we do fund education fairly well in Missouri, but uh, I don't know enough about that. I think Woody probably would know why it might be, too. The, Higher education is losing state funding, as far as I know, in every state in the union. Right. If there are a couple of exceptions, I, I suspect I could name them and they're broke. Uh, it, it's just going on everywhere. When I was on the Board of Curators, about a third of your education was paid for by the taxpayers. That number's down, I think, to below 25 percent today. Mm -hmm. And and when But when I was on the board in Michigan, the taxpayers were only paying 16 percent of your education back in the 90s. And Michigan University is a great university. Uh, we are privatizing our public universities slowly by inches. And if you don't like it, I, my advice to you is get used to it. There's a model, though, stop. that the University of Missouri-St. Louis is following, knowing that this is probably coming. And they're going to their foundation sure. and saying, we're going to pick no. up the cost well, to it, be able to help fund the education for You have to raise private money in a students. big way. In, in, in just a few seconds, Woody, and I mean a very few, uh, what else is going to be uh, well, overridden? Well, the big thing's right to work. It won't be overridden. Okay, and how about the, uh, the minimum wage issue? Uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I haven't been tracking. I'll be very frank. Uh, right to work is the one I've been following. They got up to about 100. And it's not going to be overridden? They got to 103 votes. <laughs> Some of those will fall away when they see it isn't going to be overridden. Mm -hmm. So I think they'll get to the well, mid-high 90s on it, and that's it. We'll see whether the state takes responsibility for the minimum wage. That's where it belongs, even though I support the people here in town that are working on it so far. Okay. It is time now for Roast and Toast, where the <laughs> Ruckettes offer cheers or jeers to people and events of the news. And we start this time with Mary. Um, I'm going to toast today the Sage of Omaha, Warren Buffett, the billionaire investor that everybody knows. Uh, Mr. Buffett came out and said uh, something very significant yesterday. He said that he is prepared to endorse Hillary Clinton for president 
and when the reporter leaned in and asked him why, he said, she has a vision of America similar to mine. He said, number one, I'll give you an example, everyone should benefit from the economic recovery that's going on in this country. And by the way, we have unemployment right now below the uh, Reagan recovery, so to speak. So the president is doing very well on that. And he, and he talked about carried interest, this uh, hedge fund um, tax break that uh, Mr. Romney and others said to, that our investors get. So he has a common vision with Hillary. Good for him. Well, he'll send her an email about it. Uh, yeah. Jason, <laughs> Jason. He'll send uh, her a check is what he'll do. I, I want to toast the United Way of Greater Kansas City. They had their uh, luncheon yesterday and in Kansas City and Union Station. There was over a thousand people there. The Adele Hall Spirit of Caring Award recipient was Burt Berkeley. He gave an amazing speech. I had never heard him speak. He's 92 years old talking about the value of the United Way and what everyone should consider important in life and giving back to our community in Kansas City. And toast to uh, the United Way and to Burt Berkeley. Woody. Uh, I'd like to toast Councilwoman Heather Hall. They had a business session here recently, and they were discussing one of the boondoggles, the, the airport, the trolley, the hotel, one of them. And she actually asked over 15 questions. And you could see the other members beginning to get restive because getting facts is not something our city council's historically been interested in. But all I can say is her motto is standing up for the Northland. In this case, she's standing up for all the people of Kansas City when she tries to actually ask tough questions. Thank you, Councilwoman Hall. Marianne. A heartfelt toast to the families of Dr. William Corcoran, Reed Underwood, and Terry Lamano, who this week learned that the death penalty was given to Fraser Glenn Cross. Rather than get into the muck um, and get into all of the issues that led to those killings, they said kindness wins out, love overall is what we want to invest in, and they will continue to do that through the years so that their families' lives were not in vain. And finally, a toast to some new words that have made it this year into the Oxford Dictionary. There's awesome sauce, a positive comment about something. Hangry, a mix of hungry and angry, used when someone gets hungry earlier than expected and is angry about it. And my favorite, mic drop used when someone deliberately drops a microphone at the end of a performance or show he considers to be particularly impressive. <laughs>